Hi, welcome back to the shop. This is going to be the final video on the uh, making of these doors for the spice uh, shelf or spice rack that belongs to my sister that my father made 50 years ago. And, um, and we're coming to the end here. Um, and so I'm going to chop things together and try to get them all in and go on to a new project because this one has sort of stretched on. And, and as most of you know, I lost a lot of footage of the work being done as it was, uh, as it was being done. So I've had to fill in and I apologize for that. This will be the last video with that sort of problem, hopefully. At this point, uh, I, I've, we've got the cabinet, uh, has a little bit of a finish on it. I've cleaned it up and, and put some, uh, some urethane on it. And I've uh, got all of the hinges worked. And, and we're going to cover cutting those uh, mortises for the hinges in, in this video. Um, and, and that actually does have... Uh, some audio in it but there are other things that happened that uh, that we lost the videotape so I did have some still pictures and I set those in here to cover that and um, that's where we're going to begin with some of the footage of where we were and I'll just talk about some of the things that we missed first of all we completed all the mortises and the tenons on the doors and um, and so once those were all complete, we laid them out on a piece of old wallpaper uh, just to keep them uh, the glue from getting on things. And uh, we glued those up and clamped them. And you can see that in, this, uh, in these little short clips of that. And uh, at the same time, before I glued them up, I went ahead and chamfered the inner moldings that you can see in the pictures um, with the 72 chamfer plane by Stanley. And then I just stopped the chamfers and cleaned them up with a, a chisel, just uh, hand doing them um, by eye. And then uh, the next thing that I did after we glued them up, um, uh, I did those chamfering. And then on the end pieces, I sawed off the two on the bottom and the top. I sawed those off and I hand chamfered those using a, a, a chisel because the 72 is too long for that end part. So uh, I did those by hand as well and you can see that and uh, as I'm trimming them to the line. I drew the lines to uh, give me an exact dimension for the chamfers and then I had to trim back to those. On the lower rails and the top rails on the outside are two extensions um, where they come out and then those are chamfered. And I did do uh, the trimming up with a chisel by hand, but I, uh, after marking the lines for where those chamfers should end, I used a 16 and a half Stanley block plane to just knock off the corners and get it close to that. And then I came back with the chisel and, and cleaned up to the line, as you can see in the video. So, as you can see, there's a jump in the video here, and uh, I've let this sit after we've done the framework for about two to three weeks, and I kept it clamped to the cabinet so that there would be no flexing and it could dry nicely and, uh, and, uh, and, and acclimate itself basically out of the shop and in the house for a little bit, <coughs> keeping the doors nice and flat. So now, uh, and you can see the time change. I'm wearing a sweater now. It's starting, uh, fall is in and uh, it's starting to cool off. So we're back to that uh, sort of uh, snuggly shop sweater. <laughs> anyway, um, I'm going to take the clamps off. We're going to take a look at the doors and I'll go back through what uh, I may have missed in the earlier videos just to refresh and we'll take it from there. Our next step is going to be after doing this is going to be mounting the hinges and setting that all up. The doors are glued and then uh, we'll put some finish on them and then we'll put them back on the cabinet with the hinges. You 
because this cabinet was made, you know, 50 years ago, and it had doors, and there are holes here for the old hinges, when I put the new hinges on, I want them to cover up the old holes and marks, but I want to make sure that uh, the, the new holes that are having to be put in here not only will hide the old holes, but I don't want them in the same pocket. So I'm offsetting them enough to hide the holes, but, um, but not wind up with the new screws in the old and, and thereby creating something that might be loose. When I'm using with this type of hinge, what I do is I basically open it fully around and it creates its own square um, the way it sits against this, this piece here. And, uh, and so it'll give me the proper depth that I want. So what I do is I put it in where I want it. I like the look of it. And then I measure the distance down so that when I go to that side, it's exactly the same. So I know now that I have five inches going up here and I can move that aside and hold on to this and now just mark what it is that I'm going to have to hollow out. Now, because I'm using a pencil rather than my marking knife, then I want to make sure when I come back in here to cut, I leave the pencil marks because it has a certain thickness. So when I do that mark, it adds width to this. I don't want that pencil line to disappear. I want to hollow out only what's within the two pencil lines leaving the mark. And then I'll just take an eraser and I'll just erase it and it'll go away and nobody will ever see it. I do the same on that side and this side and then I'll set the doors once I have the hinges and everything inlaid into the cabinet. So I marked this bottom hinge and then I checked the distance from the bottom of the cabinet to the top and the bottom to the top and I discovered that they're not exactly the same. So what I want to make sure of is that those hinges line up. So instead of doing the same measurement from the top down and there, uh, thereby uh, these two might not be uh, at the same height. So what I've done is brought out a larger rule to follow and what I'm doing is I'm measuring up this distance from the same place I measured for the bottom hinge to make sure that uh, that that is correct and then I can slide up to where I want to be and I take a new marking off of this but I'm taking the measurement from the bottom of the cabinet the same place I did for the other hinge then I'm marking it then I'll go to the other side of the cabinet and I'll do the same thing so the hinges will be at this right height from the bottom of the doors going up in order to inlay this hinge into the right depth that I need I'm going to use several tools I'm going to use a Japanese marking knife, um, some uh, calipers to check the width of this, and, uh, and the rule, again, to cut straight, and a number 71 Stanley router plane. I set it to be flush with this piece here because I don't want that to go in any deeper than that. And so that's what my cut on the cabinet will be, is that little bit. Now, here are my two lines, which probably are hard for you to see, but um, I've marked these, and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use the marking knife to come in here and to set the line that I want it to be at. And when I do that, it gives me a little notch that I deepen, and then when I come back with the router, I can come back here and work up to that notch and not worry about getting chip out this way. So those are the stages of what I'm about to do. The nice thing about the 71, the, the newer one, this is not very new, but it's the, the original didn't have this micro adjuster. You had to open this up and drop it up and down and, and, and it got iffy on, on whether or not you got the right depth. So with this micro adjuster, I can either read off the ruler here how deep it is, or I can open this up and I can just tweak it and move that blade just a little bit down for my second cut. But for right now, I've got it set so it's flush with this, and the reason is that I'm going to use it as a marking gauge, and by putting 
just the corner of the blade, just that corner against the edge, I'm using it as a marking gauge and sliding it on that angle all the way across. And that is giving me my first little cut along here to ensure that I don't have tear out in this direction. So once I get that sliced and that sliced and that sliced and then dug in a little bit, then I can um, not worry about, and what I use is I, I just take the old groove that I'm at and I set the knife, then I put this up against it and then all I have to do is come here and deepen that cut. And I'm creating a little shoulder there so that I don't tear it out. So I can tell I need to go in a little bit deeper this way, and I'm still on my first cut. This is a little high, which is fine. Now I can lower that blade and come back in and clean it up. So I lowered the blade, and now I'm just coming back in and cleaning up this surface that I already cut, and I'm still doing it sort of on an angle and slicing across the grain. I'll pull up so you can see that better, I think. But you see, I'm by doing it this way, I'm coming in here and I'm just planing off that surface. You can feel how smooth that's getting in there. But so my this will be my finish cut. And see what I do is I come in and I slice with it. So it's not just a matter of going straight in or I might hit something or break it. So what I'm trying to do here is keep this flat with the cabinet and use that blade like a knife and just come in and take off any little high spots but slicing them off not chopping that's nice and clean and I'm being very gentle in these corners because I don't want to push off and knock that off to break it. So there, that's nice. It's a little bit, it's almost perfectly flush. Right in here, I think I could come down a little bit. And check that, yeah. See, that's the nice thing about this tool is it will set the depth for you and it won't go any deeper unless you change the depth of the blade. So I'm pretty happy with that. And we did very little damage to the now, old cabinet. Not everybody has a router. So I'm going to show you how I did this before I had a router plane. And you know, it's possible to use an electric router and it's a lot faster, but it's noisier and I don't know that it's any more or less satisfying. So 
it's really everybody's preference. So what I'm doing here is I'm just marking with the knife the outside portion of the hinge. And now that I have that, it has a little seat that I can put my chisel in. Now, if I were to put my chisel in this way, you see that bevel there, that would crush this end grain of, of this going this way. So I wanna turn the flat and I wanna put it into that little groove that I made and I wanna keep it upright. I don't wanna angle it in and I don't wanna angle it out. So this is the cutting surface that I'm concerned about. I've not gone any further in and what I wanna do is just tap it straight down so I get a nice shoulder same way we did before. Now I'm turning the chisel around the other way, finding my knife cut, and getting into that, flat on the outside, perpendicular, and tap it in. And that gives me a shoulder on this side. Now, up here, if I were to drive this in too hard, I could split this piece of wood. So I want to come just to my knife line. And in this case, I'm going to bring it just a hair in out of perpendicular. And that's really, and tapping it very lightly. All I want to do is to get a good line there. If I were to really slam it, I would break this piece and then I'd have to rebuild it. So now I have a nice line there to go to. And I can use the chisel itself to actually come into that line and, and I, I can use it the same way that I was using that, uh, that router plane is to slice it rather than just push it in. And, and the reason for that is that I want to get up to my line carefully, keeping that line nice and straight. Pivoting it in, just cutting up to that line. Don't want to go past it. And same thing, little slice. Now I've got that nice shoulder there. And, and all I'm doing is turning the chisel this way a little bit, and I'm, again, slicing across the grain, using my body to control the chisel, not hitting it with a mallet or anything, using my body's strength to cut in. And there I've got my clean corner to start with. Now I have to concern myself with this line here. Okay, now again with the shoulder, if I were to come in this way and cut, this would want to dig in and go deeper and deeper and deeper. I don't want to do that. I want to come and travel across. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to even up this little line here. And I'm going to do it with a little tap of the chisel this way. get that out and I'll do the same thing on this side now I've got a clean cut there and I can take the chisel now I don't want the chisel to go this way so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use it just like that router and I'm just using it to take a level off at a time. I'm not trying to dig it deep yet. All I want to do is to go in there, just like a plane, I want to keep the surface fairly flat and I don't want to go over my line, so. Now, when you're doing something like this, oftentimes that first cut of your chisel is not enough. So you need to come in here every once in a while and replenish your shoulder so that you're coming off to a trim straight line. But it gets easier to line that up the deeper you go. 
and I'm using the bottom of my chisel as a guide to keep and retain the flatness of my cut. So it's important often to check and see how you are. We need to go a little bit wider. Right there. It's easy to slip. So you don't want to be pushing a chisel towards your hand. In this case, I get my finger locked under there, and then I'm riding that back part to get whatever's high, but I have control. I'm not just pushing it through. I'm using this finger here against it to control it. And I'm slicing my way around. I'm not um, banging into it. in the process after uh, gluing up the doors and um, and making sure they were flat trimming all the pieces in was to um, was to put a finish on it and I used a, a Minwax acrylic polyurethane and and the biggest reason for that was um, that I knew that I could apply that to the cabinet and it would adhere nicely and give a good build up as well as there was some parts of the walnut that had a little bit of tear out and I wanted to fill those with a, something that would be clear and not yellow. Uh, I didn't want to change the, uh, the coloring of the walnut. After I did the color match, I realized that that worked really well to get a matched color to what had been on there for 50 years. So um, you can see in these pictures here that I've got them laid out and I've got one or two or three coats on it. And uh, between coats I used um, uh, steel wool and I used the 3M pads to buff it down. Now the acrylic that I used was a, uh, a clear satin um, and so uh, I did still, it still had a bit of a sheen to it more than the old ca uh, cabinet so I, I, I had to knock that back down to dull it out a little bit and then uh, oil it so that that worked out fine. You can see in the pictures uh, there's some weights on the corners of the doors I found that one of the doors um, had twisted a little bit as I was applying the finish. And so I had two boards cantilevered on it with some weights on it just to keep it down tight. And, and that seemed to work. And uh, as the finish dried and everything, it, it flattened out. The next thing was to cut the glass, which I have no pictures of at all. But the, uh, but the glass is now in the doors and then I glazed them with um, with uh, uh, just uh, clear silicone um, because I didn't want it to be black. I didn't want it to be colored in any way that it would show through the cabinet door. So basically you can see here that uh, it's just got a strip of clear silicone holding those in. Now I've put the two hinges on these doors and I want to show you how I got the screws and everything lined up. So I'll do that next. So, as you can see, I've got one hinge here that's almost done and getting ready to do this one. And um, I think that this will probably show up better. So I want to show you how I did it. Um, using an awl, what I do is I rest it on the hinge flat and then I turn up to find my center of the hole. And then this doesn't matter. And then that's what I get my start with. The next thing is to use a gimlet, and uh, as you can see, a gimlet is just like an awl, except it's got a threaded uh, a uh, drill, basically, drill point. And I do that into that hole, 
and I just turn that in a couple of turns and uh, take it out. And the reason for that is just to widen that hole without breaking the tip of my awl. So if you had a wider awl, you could probably push it in too. But um, I wanted to be cautious about that. I don't want to split anything or anything like that. And this is just a, uh, a hand drill. And what I've done is I've marked the depth so that I don't get any deeper than I need to. And, um, and I start with that in that hole. And now it's got a nice point to start with. And, um, and I can crank it down and drill in just until that tape is close to the uh, to where I need it. 